Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Livio Bar, and I am the creative director of a small indie game studio called Stuck in Attic from Transylvania, Romania. Uh, before you ask, we're called Stuck in Attic because we're working out of an attic, and we get stuck in it for extended periods of time, but voluntarily, of course. And we're working on a game called Gibbous a Cthulhu Adventure. Um, and it's, uh, it's about, it's about um, this dude that accidentally finds the dreaded Necronomicon, I don't know if you're aware of the Necronomicon, and transforms his cat into a, into a talking abomination, and this is the game right here. Um, it's what we call a comedy cosmic horror point-and-click adventure, um, and we're taking a lot of cues from, um, <clears throat> from big classics like LucasArts, uh, they're our big inspiration. So uh, we're trying to make a handcrafted experience, uh, use a lot of hand-painted backgrounds and frame-by-frame um, uh, -frame animation, an extensive uh, musical soundtrack, and uh, so on. So uh, this is the game that we're making. Uh, if you could, we're doing a, an actual point-and-click situation here because I'm telling my programmer to just click at stuff and I'm pointing at, so if you could just press new game, Nico. Hey, Thank everyone, you. <laughs> and welcome to Gibbous, a Cthulhu Adventures demo. We could, uh, this is the Let intro, we could maybe skip this. I won't be long, I promise. This is how we do it. I tell the programmer what to do and he just does it, so it's advisable. Not really. Uh, so, um, as you can see, it's fully, it's fully animated. It's, uh, it's something that we, we really wanted to, to put a lot of uh, passion into, and um, it's uh, it's one of those games that when I show my when I tell my when I talk to my friends and they find out that I'm making a game they'll be like oh cool you're making a game so can I see it and I'm like yeah sure because I kind of know what's coming you know and I show them the game and they'll be like oh so so what do I do and I just tell them well you get to walk around and look at stuff you can you can examine objects and you can you can talk to these characters and you can you can if you click on that character you can actually like choose the dialogue that you're gonna have with her and they'll usually be like huh so it's just uh, so it's just walking and looking at things well yeah sort of if you look at if you look at it that way so 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 how do I shoot well you well you 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 don't really shoot in these kinds of games and the response usually is oh that's really cool hey you want to get a beer because I know this place down the road here and we can go get a beer and and it's weird because um, it's weird to think that 20 years ago point and click adventures uh, would be the games that you would show to your friends if you wanted to show them just how cool computer graphics could look and that's unfortunately changed a lot uh, throughout the years. Um, sometime in the, in the beginning of the 2000s, uh, they were almost dying there, and, and then they had a big resurgence, and then they went back down again. So, so I guess uh, it's a fair question to, uh, to ask, why are we making a fully animated uh, point-and-click adventure game? Well, for that, I'm gonna need to go to the slides. Thank you. <clears throat> because we need to go any minute now because we need to go back in time right this is my going back in time graphic right here so I was born on a snowy November morning 34 years ago maybe not that back in time um, maybe let's go back to when I was three and I was drawing all the time. I was one of those kids that was always drawing. All I wanted to do was draw up to the point that my parents would just force me to just like, go outside and play with other kids. No, I want to stay inside and draw. And uh, you know how kids uh, make their own soundtrack when they're drawing? You didn't even have to be in the same room as me to find out what I was drawing because my parents would just listen in and they'd go, oh, he's uh, drawing mercilessly slaughtering each other nights again. It's cool. Just let him be. And so you can imagine, I think, that I was heavily into cartoons. I was really into cartoons, and maybe this is something of a sad thing to admit, but one of the turning points in my life was uh, when we got cable, because that meant 12 hours of nonstop cartoons every single day, and that was a concept that my 11-year-old mind could barely wrap itself around. Like, you mean to tell me that this cartoon's gonna end? And then another one's gonna come, out, come after that one, and then another one, and it was crazy. And that's all I wanted to do. All I wanted to do now was draw and look at cartoons. And um, I think 
In one year of watching Cartoon Network, I learned more English than all my English classes combined. So I'm sorry, English teacher, but it's true, and I don't think I'm the only one. And I think it was at that time <clears throat> that I realized that I wanted to be an animator. I wanted to be an animator. I didn't really know what that meant, what that entailed, but I sort of had a little bit of a start because um, if you looked at my school notebooks and textbooks from that, from that era, all of them would have these flipbook animations on them. I don't know if you did them, but I did them. Have these flipbook animations on them, and usually they were of ninjas just ripping each other to pieces and blood and guts and bones just flying everywhere because I had discovered video games, very violent video games, and namely a video game called Mortal Kombat. And uh, see, when I was a kid back in the 90s, this is me back in the 90s, uh, at least in my small hometown, computers weren't the ubiquitous things that they are right now. I mean, <clears throat> nobody really knew what a computer really was and what you would do with it, what they were good for. I mean, at least most of the adults, because us, kid, we, we, us kids, we knew, because we knew that you could do some pretty sweet stuff in them, like play Mortal Kombat. It's me and a 486 computer right there. But us kids, we didn't own a computer. Not me, not me, not, none of my friends, and we didn't even have an arcade. Um, so this sort of entrepreneur type guy just like saw the potential there, and he started an illegitimate, illegitimate business. He had a couple of 486s in his basement. That's the basement there. And um, he would rent them out to us kids to play pirated Mortal Kombat for half an hour every day, and that's all we wanted to do all the time, just play Mortal Kombat every day for half an hour. And that's where all our, <clears throat> all our lunch money would go to, because we were getting, starting to lose weight and getting all pale and shaky, and our parents didn't know what was going on with us. What is this strange affliction? We knew what the strange affliction was. We were giving our life force to Mortal Kombat, like, your soul is mine. Um, that's all we wanted to do all the time. It's, do you ever notice how many bones just flew out of the character? I don't, I don't, when, when the fatalities would be going on, I don't think that was anatomically correct. But, but anyway, this is all we wanted to do. And if you asked me back then what my greatest wish at the time would be, I would have probably said, I want to be able to play Mortal Kombat every day for at least half an hour for free. But unfortunately, uh, those 30 minutes would just go by like that. And uh, the guy would just say, hey, time's up. And we'd us kids would just get up from the, from the computer and he'd sit down and, you know, demonstratively just play other games just to impress us. And um, we would, of course, stand around and watch because there was nothing better to do. Until one day he played a game that was another epiphany for me. And that game is called Day of the Tentacle. And this was the first time that I was witnessing a point-and-click adventure. And it was mind-blowing to me because, as I told you before, I was a big fan of of uh, cartoons, but in this game, you are controlling the cartoon character. It was an interactive experience. You were this guy, and this was like this beautiful Chuck Jones-like cartoon world, but you weren't just staring at it. You were playing, you, were, you had agency inside of this world. And then I knew that, hey, I wanted to make games too. And the thing is, the big revelation was that you could make cartoons and games at the same time, because here was proof, Day of the Tentacle was proof that you could make cartoons and games at the same time. So years passed, lots of years passed, and I finally became a um, self-taught 2D animator. So a while ago, when the opportunity finally arose for us to make an actual bona fide game, it was a no-brainer, it was very clear to me that it was going to be Mortal Kombat. No, it was going to be a LucasArts-inspired, um, fully animated point-and-click adventure game. And that's why we're making uh, Gibbous. Now, thank you, thank you. I'm a little nervous. Now, uh, as I told you before, we're a very small three-person team. Um, there's one programmer and two creative guys. Not that our programmer isn't creative, Nico, you're a very creative guy, but there's like just three of us. And of course, being indies, we have to wear a lot of hats, right? So uh, have to not only make the animations, but also paint the backgrounds and um, <clears throat> do the music and uh, write, the, write the script and uh, design the puzzles and everything. So 
when you're such a small company, I mean company, we're not really a company, we're just a small studio. When you're such a small studio, sometimes you, you feel like you need to compromise on, on, on this and that because, because of course, uh, you're just three guys in an attic trying to do something cool. And usually those compromises come from, um, from the visual side of things, right? Because you need the game, the game is important, but, and, and that's where usually like the animations and stuff like that just sort of fall by the wayside. Because that's the responsible and the sensible thing to do, right, when you're an indie developer. Well, when you're making your first game, you sort of realize that you are not as responsible or sensible as you thought you were. Because we love making frame-by-frame -frame animations. We were initially a um, small independent animation studio, and that's what we love to do. We love frame-by-frame -frame animation, and we were fortunate enough to do some pretty cool stuff. We made this video for the legendary Pixies. This, uh, we're particularly proud of this one because we made it in just one month, and that's crazy, and I'm gonna explain to you why that's crazy in a bit. They were very happy with the, with the result. Um, it was an insane experience, just making an, an, a fully animated video in just one month. Um, also made another music video for a local rapper called Vlad Dobrescu. This, this is the one, it's called Globo de Cristal. Uh, just me and Kami, the two artists working on Gibbous, we made this video in I think two months and a half or something crazy like that. I'm gonna explain why that's crazy. And uh, we also actually started making our own feature length movie called Etas, which is this one. Uh, really put a lot of energy into it until we realized that there were way too few of us and it was probably gonna take like more than a decade to just finish, finish this movie. So we, we kind of put that on ice for the moment. Maybe when we're like rich and famous, we're gonna finish it one day. So that's, that's what we love to do. We love to do frame by frame animation. And I was telling you that it was crazy that we made one uh, animated video, a full five minute, I think, animated video in one month because frame by frame anima animation is this really, really time consuming thing to do. And if you're not, uh, if you're not familiar with the, the concept, I can explain it to you. Um, this is uh, this is one of our animations, one of our uh, cat's idle animations. Um, if you want to make a frame by frame animation, if you want to make one second of animation, this is a bit longer than one second, you need to draw each and every frame. So in our case, the way we work is uh, number one over there, that's the main volume animation, you need 24 frames for that. Then you add another layer on top, which is where you add the details like the face, the spatial details and everything. And that's another 24 frames of animation, 24 different drawings. And then you come and add the final details in the color, and that's another 24 frames of animation. So in total, that's 72, 72 right? Did I get the math, the math right? Yeah, 72 frames of animation for just one second. So uh, we have this joke that if you, if you blink and you miss an animator's half a day of work, so please don't blink while watching 2D animated games or movies. Um, yeah, that's, that's why I said that it was, it was kind of crazy for us to do this. But, but still, we want to do this for Gibbous because it is very important for us, uh, for this game, to feel like it's, uh, like it's inspired by the classic cartoons and by the classic uh, games from LucasArts. And um, it's, it can sort of set you aside from other indies going down this route because most indies will probably not go down the insanely time-consuming route because they're sensible and responsible and we are sort of not. Um, that's, um, that's why we are, um, we are trying to f still focus on being a little bit responsible while, while making this game. And that's why before uh, just heading head first into, into production, I wanted to do a little bit of research into what the potential pitfalls for a first time indie dev are. And uh, they appear to fall into two big categories. <clears throat> you, either, uh, you either go way too crazy on the uh, scope and the amount of features for the game, or you go way crazy into innovating and trying new exciting stuff that may or may not work. And uh, while doing this, we realized that we kind of had uh, semi-unknowingly made the correct choice for our first game. Because um, point-and-click adventures 
are sort of a weird genre because most games, like most gaming genres, if you think about it, they've really evolved throughout the years. Like uh, if you watch a first person shooter from the early 90s, it's nothing like the shooters that you're gonna be playing now. But again, adventure games are a little, wi little bit weird in that they haven't really changed that much since the late 90s. That was when the, the sort of formula was being crystallized right there. And there have been some improvements brought to the formula uh, ever since, but they were more in the way of uh, flow and usability and streamlining and everything. Uh, there is also Telltale Games uh, style games, but that's a different story. So the, the kind of genre that we're making hasn't really evolved that much. And what did that tell us as first time indie devs? It was along the lines of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like, we are not going to try to introduce any kind of crazy new mechanics into a genre that has obviously not been very kind to said uh, crazy new mechanics. Because first of all, we're trying to make a classically inspired game. So basically, like many other indies, we're trying to make the game that we would want to be able to play right now. And also, I think it makes sense for us to know our limitations, because we know we can do good programming, we can do good story and good art and animation and music and so on. But then again, we want to be able to use what years and years of experience other, a lot smarter and more experienced and more talented people than us did way back in the day in the 1990s. So I'm not advocating against innovation. I'm just saying that it really makes sense, made sense for us to know our limitations. And uh, it really made sense for us to use this formula that, that, that the classics have developed in the 90s. Uh, we think of it as a, like a very sturdy and reliable uh, skeleton or framework that we use. We know it's gonna work because it's been working for 20 years. And we're just adding our animation and our, um, our art and our story to to it, and that frees up time for us to do some other cool things, like can we go back to the game, please? So what we wanna do with Gibbous is just make sure that everything that we're adding to the game helps. Like we don't wanna risk, we don't wanna risk uh, introducing something that's not gonna help. So for example, um, I've always hated in point and click adventures when you would use an object with another object and he'd just constantly say, your character would just const constantly say, I don't want to do that or I can't do that, that doesn't make sense, and just constantly repeating that over and over again. So what we're trying to do is a little bit crazy, but we know it's going to be an improvement. It can't not be an improvement. So for example, if you, we can use Kitty, we can use her on the blonde lady right there, and she's gonna say something. Nah, it's your chance to talk to a girl because she's sassy and everything. But then if you use her on the vegetation. No thanks, I just went recently. She's gonna say another thing. So that's like the little improvements, the little things that I think really improve a genre that let's be honest, really needs no improvement. It's a classic, like it's a, it's a timeless classic. Point and click adventures are I think timeless classics. And uh, if we could go back to the slides again. Another thing that, that, that's, that this frees uh, up time for us is to do uh, cutscenes. And I know a lot of, for a lot of indies, it really makes sense not to do any cutscenes because they're not sort of essential to the game if you're making an action game or whatever. Um, but for us, being a story-based game, it really makes sense for us to have cutscenes. And I can show you a work in progress from our intro animation. Again, work in progress. Yes, Sister Halo, that's, that's the one. Next time, maybe you let the actual cult leader speak this eternally horrible name. Yeah? Thank you. The, uh, <clears throat> the Necronomicon! Yes, no doubt some among you have questioned its very existence. Our search has been wide and our labor great, with as yet no return. Well, brothers and sisters, it may be that we have come upon its actual location. Uh, Brother Bright, Gregory, Gregory! We talked about this, man. See, because Gregory wasn't paying attention because he was fiddling with his phone. There's always those people fiddling with their phones, right? Um, so that's the kind of stuff that we, we want to be able to bring to this game. Uh, but then comes the question, how do, you, how do you afford all of that? Like, how do you afford making all the hand-painted uh, backgrounds and all the uh, animations and all the music and the t voice talent and so on? 
And uh, the answer is, as a small three-person indie from the middle of nowhere, Romania, you, don't, you can't really afford all of that. And that's why you grow, go crowdfunding. And that's what we did with Gibbus. We, we successfully crowdfunded it this uh, the May, May of this year to the tune of $55,000. And we are eternally grateful to all the people who have supported this game. If there's any of you here in the audience, and I think there are, thank you very much. Because you're actually making this game happen. And that's why I love crowdfunding, because it gives games like this the opportunity to, to exist. Because um, I don't know if Gibbous would have existed had there not been this enthusiasm uh, about it on crowdfunding. And another reason I love crowdfunding uh, for is that it's, just, it's not just about the money. Of course, the money helps, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to make the game. But at some point, it just stops being this cold, uh, you know, I produce this product and you buy it from me, exchange, and it, it stops being about the money and starts being about building a community of people that are really passionate about uh, your game or about this genre of game. Because um, we found that out during the Kickstarter. We sort of knew that that was probably going to happen. We, did, we also did the Kickstarter because we wanted to know that there was interest for this game. If, if we wouldn't have gotten funded or we would have gotten very small, a very small amount of funding, we would have probably said, well, it doesn't make sense to make this game. But, but you're going directly to your audience. That's another thing that I really love about Kickstarters, because we didn't go, I have nothing against publishers. Again, we, we just didn't think it made sense for this game to go directly to a publisher. We wanted to go directly to the people that wanted to play it. And that was a very cool surprise for us to just uh, see how many people got involved. And that's the thing. People get involved. People don't, they're, they're not on Kickstarter just to throw some money at you and get a, the game a little bit cheaper. No, they're there because they care about your game. And we started doing this community thing with, with our backers in the, during the first week of our campaign. You know, sort of timidly, we didn't really know what we were doing. And by the, the, the final day of the campaign, we were, we already knew by name a lot of our backers and we knew our quirks and their personalities and this guy's always making puns and that guy's always helping out and, and I think that was one of the most beautiful things for us, just for us to actually virtually meet our audience and I think it was pretty cool for them to meet us too. Um, another thing that I think was pretty important for our Kickstarter was the fact that we made a demo prior to launching it. And uh, it was important because, first of all, we were proving that we could actually make the game because there's a lot of cool art filled games on Kickstarter that may or may not have a programmer behind them. So that's what we were proving. We can actually make the game. Also, our backers were getting a little bit of a taste of the game. They weren't just going in uh, blind. And we also found out just what the hell we were getting ourselves into. And, um, and another thing that was that we suspected and that was proven um, by our demo was that people really love Kitty, our cat, and people love cats in general. And that's one advice that I would give everybody, just put a cat in your game. It's gonna, it's gonna improve the game. I don't care if it's a tactics simulator or, everything, or anything, just make it a mascot or something like that, put a cat. I know there are those weird people who don't like cats, probably have some in the audience, just ignore them, put a cat in your game. <laughs> it's gonna really improve it. So, um, so yeah, the Kickstarter was great. I would say if you're an indie developer and you believe in your game, go for it. But there are some things that you should take into consideration. Don't do it cynically, like, hey, this is my game. I don't really care about it. Give me your money, because people will, will not like that, and they will not back your game. They're there for someone who's really passionate about what they do. And um, you need to be passionate, and you need to be transparent, and most of all, you need to be a human. They, people want to, to, to have this face of a human that is attached to the game. So basically be a transparent human, I guess. So um, it was a great experience for us. Uh, another great, great surprise for us was the fact that a lot of people from uh, Romania and from Bucharest backed us. Actually, one of the greatest surprises was that the number one city that we got pledges from was Bucharest. And if this was a rock concert, I would say, thank you, Bucharest. Uh, but it's not so. Uh, but another advice that I would have, if you want to kickstart, don't do it from Bucharest or New York or London or any cool place where there's things happening. Do it from a small, crappy town like ours. Because if nothing ever happens in your town, 
then you're going to have time to just focus on the game because I'd just be sitting at my desk and seeing that the sun's going down, it'd be summer and like, hey, am I missing out? No, I'm not missing out on anything. I'll just work on the game. So, um, so at this point, I, uh, I really wish there, was, there would be some kind of cool like conclusion that I could take everything that I've been talking about and wrap it into it. But, but uh, unfortunately, that proved a lot more difficult to do than I had imagined. But that's okay because it's almost a tradition now for, for point and click adventures to just end abruptly because they ran out of budget. So I think I'll do the same thing with this talk and say, hey, I wish uh, there was more, but I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And if you have any questions, I am uh, willing to answer. Turgumuras, Romania. It's a small town, nothing happened. It's nice, it's really nice. It's a place to go and die, just die there. Retire and die. Yeah, we, we are going for uh, PC, Mac, and Linux for now and we're not excluding uh, mobile platforms. Uh, the thing with mobile is that we have lots, as I was mentioning, lots and lots of animations and lots of uh, audio, like a lot of uh, dialogues, voiced, everything is voiced in the game. So that we're, we're, still, we're still considering that, but PC, Mac, and Linux are our main platforms for now. The launch date? Oh, uh, when it's done. <laughs> sometime, hopefully sometime uh, next summer. Uh, I, I would love to say definitely next summer, but there are factors that are beyond our control, like translating the game into five different languages and just getting all the actors, the voice actors, it's like herding cats, just getting them to, cats again, to <laughs> work together. But yeah, hopefully late next summer. Did I say autumn? Yes, winter. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting because you can't kickstart from Romania. So hope, uh, luckily, we our small studio is part of a firm that has representation in. Uh, we're sort of like a small startup from a firm, right? And it has representation in Switzerland. So we just went to one of our of our colleagues from Switzerland and say, said, "Hey, Stefan, can we borrow your account? Maybe you might get fifty thousand dollars in your Kickstarter account <laughs> if we do this." So we just, yeah, we just had. You can't, unfortunately, can't kickstart from from, from Romania, and that's a. Uh, that's one huge obstacle. So you, you, might, you, you, you really want to have someone that you really trust somewhere in the kickstarterable countries. Well, if that's it, thank you very much for your attention.